Where to begin? Um, welcome to the Himal Fiction Fest. It's the first one we're doing, um, and I think we can promise you that it won't be the last. Um, and I think I am the lucky person who gets to tell you why, uh, because we've been enjoying this enormously. Of course, it would have been amazing to do this in person, to have all of the people in this virtual room, in the same physical room. Um, sadly, that would have meant that a lot of us couldn't be together, I think, because our visa regimes in this part of the world are not exactly conducive, let's say. So thank you for being here. I'm glad that we're able to cross borders, even if it's virtually, to hear and get to know three incredible writers from South Asia. And of course, hear and get to know three incredible figures who have kind of been there and done that uh, when it comes to fiction in South Asia and um, are here to, to lend support and also to, um, to um, share some of their, their knowledge. Um, I know that um, two of them are running a little bit late and will be joining us uh, shortly. Um, but I just want to um, start out by saying um, a big thank you first to Marlon, who really anchored a lot of the work for um, this from uh, Himal's end, and also to Neha, our engagement editor behind the scenes, who's also been doing a lot of the work to get the word out. So thank you to both of you guys, really. Um, and with that, I think that you know the stars of the show today um, are, of course, the writers. And I just want to say... Um, to all three of you, you know, um, as editors, we've had the pleasure of reading and rereading your stories from the time they came in to edits, to proofs. So we've been able to, I think, um, swim deep in them, um, so to speak. And it's been incredible. It's, um, you know, just um, for me, each of you has such an incredible voice. It's so, you know, you could, I mean, um, after reading your stories a couple of times, I think that, you know, if you blindfolded me um, and gave me another one of your stories and someone read it out to me, I could probably recognize the voice. And that's a really good, amazing thing. Um, Himal, of course, has always been a home to, to South Asian fiction. I know that, you know, so many um, great writers who have gone on to do amazing things and, and really show, um, you know, parts of life and, and just what South Asia is about to the rest of the world and to others in South Asia. Um, so many of them have gotten a start in, at Himal. And I hope that, you know, for you guys as well, um, that you keep writing, that um, we'll be able to see more of your names and your work in Himal, and that you guys will go on to, to really be the next generation of South Asian storytellers, which is why we're um, organizing this event for us. I think it's extremely important in a in a you know a media landscape where I think fiction is very often given short shrift um, to give young writers um, and not necessarily young writers, right? You don't need to be young to to dive into fiction um, and try your hand at it. Anyone who's who's bold enough to write for for the wider world and to put themselves out there. Um, we just want to say we admire the courage, we admire the hard work, and thank you. So with that, I want to say a big um, welcome to Kiara, um, to Sahir, whose story went up um, today um, to kick off our Fiction Fest, and also to Siddharth. Thank you guys for joining us from your respective homes. Um, also, a big thank you to Rifat for being here with us today. Um, we will, of course, um, start with readings and then go on to a quick panel discussion, but I won't get ahead of things. I won't get into all those details. I want to say thank you to all of you here for joining us. Please do spread the word that the Himal Fiction Fest is on. The first story, Sahar's story, went up this morning. Um, for the rest of this week, Wednesday and Friday, we will have Siddharth's story and Kiara's story going up as well. Next week, we've got uh, another reading session with three more incredible new voices and also three really um, cool people who are um, part of the, the publishing industry and the writing industry in, in South Asia. So please come to our website, himalmag.com, follow us on social media, read the stories, most importantly, um, and just keep an eye out um, on the website for the next two weeks as we give you really, I think, the most exciting new um, short stories and fiction that South Asia has to offer. Marlon, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Roman. So, uh, and thank you all again for joining the um, you know panel today and the reading and discussion. Um, so, in the coming two weeks, as Roman uh, uh, said, uh, we are very excited to have you know like delve into regional stories telling from six South Asian writers. 
And uh, today's panel uh, will be of two parts. Uh, now in the first part, we will hear from the work of the three writers we feature for this week. Um, then we will move on to move into a discussion uh, on the South Asian literary landscape with our three experts. Uh, so to start things off, uh, we will first hear from uh, Sahir Hasnain. Uh, Sahir is a researcher at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, she works on global food, food systems. She's also the recipient of the Salam Award for Imaginative Fiction in Pakistan for her story, Children Always Come Home. Uh, her, her entry for uh, Hima Fiction Fest is containing lightning. And as Roman mentioned before, it was uh, launched earlier today. Uh, it is about a woman who gets struck by lightning and survives. Uh, for us today, uh, Sahir will read uh, an excerpt uh, from her story containing lightning and also from, her, uh, from an unpublished work titled Attend. Um, over to you, Sahir. Thank you very much, Marlon and Roman, for that excellent introduction to the whole fest. Uh, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be on today and to listen to everybody's stories, and I can't wait to read the others as well. Um, so I'll start with the reading of this other public, unpublished story called Attend, and it is about a low energy future. I thought to really hammer in the fact that I'm from the Environmental Change Institute. So I'll begin the reading on that story now. The room contained a normal amount of chairs. A normal amount of chairs is one chair. People are extravagant when it comes to chairs and most other things. The downshifting was done in two days. Two days for clearing out two decades worth of things, energy and energy in things. This was an achievement. The attention economy has evolved in interesting ways with the sustainability world. She would now spend the rest of her life paying attention to a family in Pakistan. That's it, not write about it or talk about it or be thoughtful about it, just pay attention. The curator and the team organized the content and media streams for her and she just paid attention. And all the family knew was that she was watching and that she was real. But generally, if people are sad enough, they don't care about what's real and what isn't. I'll stop that excerpt there. And now I'll go on to the excerpt from Containing Lightning, uh, recognizing that some people might not have read it. They really look forward to your comments on it. This is a very different story. Um, and like Marlon said, it's about the experience of the aftermath of a lightning strike for a very particular person. I will begin the reading now. This was probably the fifth most exciting thing to happen in our little nook of society. It wasn't way up there with the sudden wedding of Asifa's son, or even the strange color scheme of the Jaffer's new neighbors. This was such a different kind of exciting that society spent more time trying to slot it into something familiar. Hence the inquiries about my activities and what I could have done to inspire a jealous gaze. This last one was baffling to everyone involved because there was literally nothing to be envious of. My aunt would say that the evil eye could look right through me because there was nothing to see. Trust you to be the most boring lightning strike survivor. My husband drives me around now. Not that I can't, but he read that some victims have trouble with navigation on a forum for the spouses of survivors. The car was fairly new after all, and the daughter fairly young. Did you discover your superpower yet? My daughter had been reading articles on people who can do grand things after lightning strikes. I have never done a grand thing in my life. What if I try something grand now, and that is what killed me? Why can't you be a cool mom, like on the TV shows, or like Meryl's mom? I hear this often from her. She is very young, but very adept at making complicated sentences that deeply hurt her feelings. That particular one doesn't really. If you hear things often enough, they become very normal. I'm told to be cool a lot, while also being told how nice it is that I'm not cool. This is all right, because all the cool and popular people I know seem to have very stressful lives, like Eleanor on the forum or my friend Annika. Annika sells expensive cars to foolish people and then uses that money to go on long vacations on big yachts and have short love affairs with unhappy men who live in gray houses. This all sounds terrifically tedious. I still enjoy talking to her though, because she can go an entire hour, not just talking about the newest prints from Cadi or the expensive school fees or how the whole day just flies by in dropping and collecting various children to various schools 
and monitoring mates and making phone calls to family members that make everyone unhappy. Annika just talks about interesting things she's done or read about or someone has told her. She occasionally remembers to ask me what life is like and you can hear her being actually interested that someone can get by like this. I try to remember how we became friends and I can't remember. This is an interesting point and I noted down in my survivor's journal. The forum has advised to keep one so that unusual symptoms can be kept track of. I decided to find my daughter and make her ask me some questions. She asked me a lot of questions and took lots of notes on her phone. The evening with my daughter had two main results. The first is that I am definitely forgetting things. And the second is that she wishes that her father's ex-wife had been her mother instead of me. I have suspected this for a while, but now I know. It is quite sad to know that someone you gave birth to feels for you so little, but I'm hoping it's a phase of light-handed cruelty. Women are very good at that, and our society encourages you to start young. I'll end the reading there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to questions and comments. And again, really grateful to be here. Thank you so much, Sayed. Now, if this is a, a, a physical room, as Roman uh, suggested before, you know, there will be sounds of applause. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your reading. And uh, just, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, like we do this at, at our meetings also. I mean, there's, there are emojis. You can uh, express yourselves if you want to. You see these emojis and you have the chat, right? Um, but yeah, you know, getting back to the excerpt, and I think uh, you read one of the favorite lines of mine, uh, which is uh, when the daughter asked, uh, did, you, did you discover your superpowers yet? You know, which I found uh, to be hilarious. Now, uh, so I, I do have a question for you. Now, throughout the, uh, the story, the relationships between um, the different family members, you know, I felt was crafted very carefully. So uh, my question is, how did you approach the characterization of the protagonist's uh, family dynamics? And, uh, and I'm particularly interested in the, in the daughter, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship between the mother and the daughter. Thank you, Marlon, excellent question. Um, so this was a bit stressful to write because there's quite a lot of underhanded cruelty in the whole story. And a lot of it assumes that because this person is, you know, so uninteresting that literally no one would be envious of her or jealous of her, the assumption is that a person like this will never react to the kinds of things you say. And some of that is throughout the whole story, like the way her husband reacts and the way her daughter reacts. And the thing that we hear is the internal thoughts of the main character. Um, and it, so the reason I addressed it like that was one, to look at how we assume that the people around us are like, because um, a lot of it comes from that we, it's very easy to be cruel and horrible to the people we love the most partly because we love them so much and they're right there and it's a terrible fact of our society as well and I think the when it comes to this one it is usually when we come to stories we always see the aftermath of cruelty and patronizing or condescending behavior but this is sort of looking at well what if the person that all of this is directed to doesn't ever really react because you know they're not special or stand out in any way and I think that's sort of the undercurrent the fact that she is valued in that way as a family member is because she doesn't do any of the things that you'd expect. So there is that constant cruelty, which she doesn't really, you know, react to physically, but you see the thoughts there. But yes, so a lot of it is about assumptions and how we perceive the people who are around us all the time and really hoping that, you know, eventually all of us have kids who don't do that. Um, mm. But yeah, a lot of it was just thinking, how are we as kids to our parents? So... Yeah. Yes, painful self-reflection there. I didn't do your question justice, Marlon, but we can probably talk about that later. No, I think you did. I think you did, yeah. I mean, made me think about my parents too and I, how, how I talk to them, but yeah. Um, thank you, Sahid. Thank you for, the, for, the, for that wonderful reading. And uh, let's uh, move on to our second reading of the day. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Kiara Manduli Mendis uh, to the floor. Uh, Kiara is based in Colombo and uh, her collections of short stories, the red... Uh, uh, brick wall uh, and the Lanka box was shortlisted for the Gratian Prize. Um, Kiara holds an MA in English in uh, English studies and is serving as an officer of the Sri Lanka Administrative Services. Um, Kiara's story, Deep Red Carnations, 
will be released uh, on Wednesday. Uh, today, she will read for us an excerpt from that story, as well as from a, uh, from another story uh, titled The Gotu Collar Patch, uh, previously published in the Indian Review. Kiara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malan. Uh, so first I should mention that this story, Deep Red Carnations, uh, it was a very personal story to me and I have modeled it after my own experience, like one of my own experiences. So, um, so it was a, a very liberating experience writing this story as well. So I would like to read an excerpt uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's about school days and it's about, uh, it's about forgiving yourself for the things that you uh, do when you don't know better. So this is the setting is a convent school. Um, it's about like the relationships that you have with people and your colleagues and how you react to their behavior when you're in a convent because your thinking is very limited and like uh, you tend to believe what you're taught because you don't really know better. So. Uh, let me read somewhere in the middle. You wonder what Sister Genevieve would say if she saw you now in your pixie cut with purple highlights. She would touch the top of her black veil with both her hands and say, oh, my sweet mother of Jesus, what have you done to your beautiful long hair? And use the scapula of her long white robe to wipe the sweat off her forehead. She would give you a disapproving look and shake her head. Then she would need a glass of water, the same way she did once she read the one message on Aralia's mobile phone that day, which said, I enjoy talking to you. You remember your fingers shivering as you held the mobile phone in your hand, allowing her to read the message. It was from a boy. Reminds me of the one who went and got pregnant said Sister Mary Agatha in a haunting voice as she peeped from the side reading the message. Pregnant, your fingertips got cold and your skin was as pale as Eucharist bread. You wondered if holding the mobile phone would get you pregnant too, even slightly. So once you were asked to go back to class, you ran to the washroom and washed your hand twice with Dettol. As soon as you went back to class, you buried your head in your hands and cried. You cried and cried and cried. Your friends said it was not your fault. Daisy said Aralia had even had a secret Facebook profile and all who had noticed that Aralia had her legs shaved that day. And Pumi had seen her laughing with a boy at Apico supermarket the previous Saturday. So Aralia was anyway a bad girl, a very bad girl. But you remembered that when Aralia said it was too cliche for a convent girl to learn the piano and started learning the trombone instead, everyone thought she was an interesting girl. When she told Sister Ingrid, who taught literature, that Henchard did not deserve that ending in the mayor of Casterbridge, and that she did not agree with Hardy's idea that happiness is only an occasional episode in the general drama of pain, she was a sharp girl. And when she always got all the angles in cyclic quadrilaterals right, she was a smart girl. However, at the end of every conversation she had with Sister Genevieve, she was a wicked girl. Is God a he or a she? He. Wrong, sister. I think God is a she. Don't you dare say something sinful like that. How come? You're a woman. Is it a sin being you? Shut up or I'll take you to Sister Principal. Have you ever wanted to hold Holy Mass by yourself without a priest? No. Well, Sister, having had so many Masses for so long, if you still want a man to come and do his little thing, which you can jolly well do yourselves even better, that's just sad. And so uninspiring as teachers. Aralia nodded her head in despair. You wicked girl turning into a feminazi? Come with me, we are going to Sister Principal right now. After this argument, you all were asked to stop reading Wolf, Atwood, Das, lest everyone ended up feminists. Not even Alcott, because of Joe March, you guessed. As you reached the Loops Grotto, 
right next to the chapel. Do you remember the day you hid behind it and watched Aralia's parents dragging her out of the car into the convent parlor? Her God-fearing parents wanted the sister principal to have mercy on Aralia and board her in the convent so that she could learn her lesson, that she could repent and confess and learn to be a good girl. You'd still remember Aralia's eyes full of tears shooting both hatred and terror left and right as she glared at the Lord's grotto, as she glared at you. That is how you would always remember her eyes, like crackling fire pressed under a clay pot against its will, struggling to burst into flames and set fire to an entire city any second. Sister Principal agreed to transfer her to a convent school in Hatton. Same congregation, same standards, but a little colder. Lourdes Aralia Fernando was thus forgotten until Olu, who had gone back to the convent school for grade one admission of her child, uploaded a photo taken with Aralia on Facebook. Aralia in a long white robe and a black veil, in round framed spectacles, dull black. The painter, the feminist, the stand up comedian, a nun. And it was all your fault. So uh, that was from Deep Red Carnations. And I'd like to read a little bit from a story that was uh, previously published in uh, the Indian Review. It's titled The Gotokola Patch. It was a peep at first to see if Sherin was cooking, to see what Sherin was cooking. You always wondered if they ate the same things you did because they spoke a different language. It was a part of your daily routine to go to Sherin's Facebook page from your daughter's mobile and scroll up and down for no reason. Given her posts, which often carried the word independent, whatever that meant, along with big complicated words like stereotyping, feminism, which you never understood, you always wanted to believe she was one of those women who refused to cook. When it made a part of you proud of the responsible, hardworking mother that you were, it also made a part of you always wonder what they ate, Sherin and her husband. You only had to come to the fence and pretend to pluck curry leaves to get a glimpse of what Sherin was chopping in her kitchen, but you could not. A window with a half-open pane could only show so much. But you were glad you lived six feet above to know you could always peep and have a look at the mysterious house below was quite comforting. You remember the last time you were at their place, a new year, about 10 years ago. They served you a very light tea with no sugar and a few biscuits. The biscuits were very tasty and had little pieces of chocolate in them. And instead of the word biscuit, they used the word cookies for some reason. The word sounded very childish, but also like something you could never afford. You could not picture yourself walking to the village boutique nearby and asking Malini Nanda if they had cookies. But you admired the teacups. Your teacups were of the same shape. You remember Sherin's sister, who was almost 30 with no kids and who still had not given up studying asking if the tea was orange peco. You were sure it wasn't orange. It was just tea. You wanted to burst out laughing because despite all her postgraduate degrees, she seemed to be very, very stupid. But you did not because it did not sound hilarious to anyone else. But now that everyone had to stay indoors until the government lifted the curfew, you were glad you could get sudden glimpses of the house down below. You could see more of Sherin and what, did, what she did when she was at home. You started a small gotukala patch under the kochi plants so that you could look at the land down there without arousing suspicion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiara. And um, I mean, within your second excerpt, there was a, a tea without sugar <laughs> in Sri Lanka. <laughs> there was a tea served without sugar, right? I did. <laughs> because, <laughs> because we usually tend to give, uh, you know, 
more like and more a very sugar strong like, version. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then you spoke about like orange pick also, then, then I kind of got it. Sorry, guys, the uh, enthusiasts here, but uh, thank you so much for that reading. Um, now, without giving away too much, uh, if you go back to red, uh, uh, deep red carnations, I really love the transitions between the present and the past. Um, could you like elaborate on your approach to ensuring, because when you do this, when you kind of move between the past and the present, present um, to ensure that the transitions are like, you know, uh, seamless, you know, did, did you uh, think about that or like, can you um, uh, talk about your approach from like a stylistic standpoint and also in terms of like maintaining the narrative flow? Um, well, I think uh, when, when I write stories, I tend to think in pictures. Like when I think of a scene, I would uh, think of it as a picture. Uh, so, like, because the story has past and present, uh, so I would imagine the girl going back to the convent school, like, as a picture, and her school days, again, as a scene, then it was very easy for me to, like, uh, create the atmosphere and the setting and everything, because this was modeled after a personal experience, it was actually very easy for me to do that. Um, I, but I, I always believe that stories get written like uh, sometimes uh, when you start writing, the story flows and we really don't know from where these thoughts and these ideas come. But I, I like to believe that stories get written. So although it's very difficult with work and other things, uh, I somehow try to get the first draft written at a stretch, like, like get everything onto one document, uh, like at least the points or the things that I have to talk about. Uh, so that after rounds and rounds of edits, you can polish it and you can like cut and chop and turn things up and down. But uh, I like to get that uh, first ideas together onto paper so that uh, these transitions, uh, it's easier to make these transitions. So I think uh, probably that's why I guess. <laughs> All right, great. I mean, uh, to hear you say like you think in pictures when it comes to, you know, uh, crafting your story, that's super interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, the illustrator, I mean, Mansil, who, uh, who drew, uh, who, who came up with an illustration for, for your story, also has a picture and it's a very yeah, uh, it was very a beautiful vibrant. like it was it yeah. reflected the present and the past beautifully i really love the illustration thank you so much okay. and congratulations all to right. you uh -huh. all right so that's all i want to ask but anyway uh shall we move on to uh siddharth uh i would like to invite you to the floor to read from your work siddharth uh siddharth is a writer and a student of english literature uh, his stories have previously been published by Jagari Lit, uh, the Bombay Lit magazine, and the Bangalore Lit Review. Um, Siddharth's story for us is uh, The Odyssey of Kata Singh. Uh, it's about a um, long distance bus driver in Himshal uh, Pradesh. And uh, Siddharth will read an excerpt from his story for Himal and also an excerpt from uh, No Drama at uh, Nawala Meat Shop, uh, published in the Bombay uh, Lit Mag. Siddharth, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Vardhan. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I thought I'd read from um, Nawala Meat Shop first, this story called No Drama at Nawala Meat Shop, which is really this sort of plotless story about four people working in a meat shop. Um, and it's just a sort of day in their life when one of them, who happens to be a vegetarian, is about to quit. Um, but the excerpt that I've chosen, I think, is more representative of just the things that they're doing. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, it's uh, of some uh, experience to everybody here. Uh, Gurdeep looked up from his phone to observe the first customer. Mr. Sharma was looking on with a quiet smile at a garlanded picture of Durga up on the wall. He raised his hands to the three neatly stacked folds of skin on his forehead. And then he said, Hello, Gurdeep. 300 grams of my regular pack of meat, please. Gurdeep nodded and said to Ravinder, 300 grams mutton, put in extra liver, bone piece, nali. Glad to already have the mutton lined up. 
Ravinder told Rajkumar to hand him a liver from the blue tub, and he placed this large slab of bread beside him on the floor. Mr. Sharma was watching through the panel of fiberglass that separated them, and he took note of the liver and goat tail juxtaposed beside Ravinder's big toe. It was a nice toe. He observed its pink nail, not at all overgrown, a glint of white filmed across its curvature. Mr. Sharma had just remarked to himself that the toe could perfectly outline the letter U when Ravinder raised his cleaver again, except that this time he felt the onset of a sneeze, and as his nostrils twitched and black fluttered into his vision, the grip, his grip on the broad knife loosened, and it appeared that the knife would fall. The U of his toe tilted on its axis slightly, stricken with tension, as if it alicized. Mr. Sharma blinked as the knife came slicing down, but on the carcass's spine. There was no sneeze, and Ravinder safely chopped his way down the goat, which began to open itself like a book. One half was preserved for later, the other was put splat across the table trunk. He cleaved off a leg, removed the muscles and rack stuck to the spliced spine, and then chopped the spine into peaty squares too. All the while, Ravinder worked with a certain audacity. As the goat progressively disappeared, he discarded its extra bones and sinew in the manner of a sculptor blowing out grain and dust from a freshly chiseled elbow on a statue. Ravinder worked as if he was not in the business of diminishing anything. Far from it, he was in the process of creating something, of bringing something into existence. Um, so that's the excerpt from No Drama at Nawala Meat Shop. And uh, I'll just read from Odyssey of Kartar Singh. Um, like uh, Marlon was just saying, it's uh, a story about um, a bus driver um, who's driving a bus from Miklorganj to uh, Miklorganj, which is a hill station in India, to his village in Punjab. And um, it just so happens that at this particular moment in the story, he, he's been forced to be late. And now he has to do something whatever he can to uh, rectify this situation. On a day when the clocks made sense, Kartar Singh would have had time for outrage at such a casual insult. But there was no time. He was 15 minutes late. He shifted in his seat. In the conductor's chair, Sanju let out a long sigh pulled from the depths of Pahadi lungs. Both he and Rocky buckled their seat belts. There would be no sleep for some time now. Kartar Singh smacked a hand on the steering wheel and twisted the keys. The bus growled at his command, its headlights flooding the dark with light and revealing dust particles that twirled as if to get out of the way. The bus lunged into action and the passengers gasped as they were tossed about in HP825285. Kartar Singh rested back his 15 minutes with a walloping elegance of skill and violence. Potholes and craters were slammed over, Shocked sedans wavered aside under the roaring blast of the horn. Bends around the mountains were traced to their very edge. By the time they were reaching Una and the mountains were stretched into flatter lands, Kartar Singh eased his pressure on the pedals, and the steering wheel no longer needed to be grappled with, as if the bus was a ship, careening away from the dense waves of a stormy sea. All control was restored, and the passengers drifted into sleep their mouths open, heads limp on alternating shoulders as dictated by the wrists of Kartar Singh. That's it. Thank you, Siddha. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I also wanted to ask you because I was very fascinated by your story. It's actually one of the first uh, uh, stories that the editor selected for the festival. Um, now, I have come across bus drivers in my village back in Kandy who were very interesting characters, to say the least. And, uh, you know, I still remember the, the, the bus number, it's YT-103. So it kind of, uh, you know, when I was reading your story, the bus number comes up uh, uh, several times. So it, it kind of reminded me of that as well. I mean, my question is uh, quite simple. What is the inspiration behind uh, the story? Um... Well, I, I actually do have a real person in mind. So I often, uh, I'm from Dharamshala and I often take a bus 
um, and I often took the same bus. So, I mean, you know, I had no interaction with this bus driver, but I mean, he's the person that I had in mind. But I think, I mean, there is, one can give a somewhat discursive answer to that question. What is the inspiration or where does the character come from? Uh, but I think one has to be a bit cautious. Um, so it's perfectly true that he's, it's based somewhat on some real mm. person, but I have no idea who that person actually is. Um, and uh, simultaneously, it's also true, for example, that a lot of what his character is, um, I sort of wrote in contrast to, say, Ulysses, Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ulysses. Mm. Um, and... Uh, you know, so it's true that uh, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ulysses, I mean, he wants to be somebody who's and a part of an equal temper of heroic hearts and, you know, sort of like a, a adventurer. And he wants to go away from his wife and child. Whereas uh, Kartar Singh is then the opposite of that, I realized, in that he wants to go home. He doesn't like adventure. He doesn't like things getting in the way of his plan. Um, he wants to go... He, he has figured out over the length of his career the perfect formula and he is interested in just applying it. Um, so, uh, you know, in some sense, then I suppose it, one could say that his character comes from Ulysses and comes from that person whose name also I don't know, but who drives this Lakshmi travels bus um, from Delhi to um, Miklodganj. But I think that to stop there it would be somewhat disingenuous because. I think there is a tendency, at least I I certainly had this tendency to think of characters as fictional people. And it somewhat, at least it seemed very self-evident to me, but I think in large part, the writing of a story is thinking and doing simultaneously. At once you are thinking and doing. Um, so one has to think a lot. <laughs> um, and um, I think that say Aristotle, I think he had the right idea about what a character is. You have to think about what a character is. Um, so in his poetics, um, he has, uh, he makes a distinction. His poet poetics is, of course, he's talking about his account of um, a good uh, tragedy. And he makes a distinction there, which um, I found are very useful. And I think when I was writing the story, it, those ideas really started to make sense to me. This The distinction that he makes is between a character and what he calls an agent, which is the actor. And that distinction, I think, is telling because then the character is not, say, in a play, the person that you see in front of you, but the character is something more deeper. And um, it's something which is actually, in fact, not there. So in fiction, the real thing is the character and it's the things that you are actually seeing that are not quite real. Um, and in Aristotle's account, say, the character is a system then of values. It's a system of morals. And um, it's a system of motivations. So when it comes to this story, having somewhat of an understanding of what character is in general, um, I asked myself, okay, who is he? You know, I mean, it's not just the fact that he is called Kartar Singh or that he drives a bus from Miklodganj to um, Delhi. That is his character. His character must be something deeper. Um, so his value, what are his values, essentially? And I realize his values are dignity. You know, his character is that of a dignified person who takes pride in what he does. And um, he's a maestro, but it just happens to be the case that he's a maestro of driving buses. Um, and so once you have a better sense, I felt like once I had a better sense of these internal um, aspects of who he is, then you could more surely move from the internal to the external aspects, right? So the fact that he's driving a bus means that, and he is dignified and he takes pride in his skill means that he would behave a certain way. And he, so, I mean, he fleshed out along the way as someone who doesn't, he's a bus driver who doesn't care about his passengers. In fact, his passengers are somewhat a problem. He would prefer that there were no passengers, right? His job is just to apply his uh, formula. And so he doesn't care about who's in the bus, the uh, conductor, the emergency bus driver. The passengers can, you know, they're impediments in that they can threaten his 
they can threaten his plan. Um, so, you know, once I had a better sense of the internal things, these extra, the structure of his character, I realized is sort of structured towards a cold individual. He doesn't talk much. He's just focused. Um, but like to go back to that reverse Ulysses thing, I thought that his character could be made to flourish a little more uh, if his motivation would be something like love and family, right? Mm. So then he becomes somebody who's cold and warm at the same time. Um, in that it's not just that, you know, he doesn't care about people and it's just about driving the bus. He's, yeah. He has to go home and he has to go to his wife and um, child. So his character then uh, emerged as I was sort of more purposely thinking about these things. I felt the the more sure I became of the internal aspects of who he was, the easier it became to sort of segue into the more evident things that are being described, like he's driving the bus or that he's uh, walking out of a dhaba or something like that. So, yeah, I think that stressing that distinction is That's important it. because you're not just describing something, the effort is to create something. So, exactly. um, yeah. Thanks, Siddharth, for that very thoughtful answer. Um, you guys can read uh, Siddharth's story, which will be coming out uh, on Friday. Um, now, uh, I'd like to bring to the floor our wonderful illustrator, Mansil Rizal from Kathmandu, uh, into this discussion. And uh, just to say a few words about Mansil. Uh, Mansil is an illustrator and graphic designer based in Kathmandu. And he has been involved in projects such as uh, Kathmandu uh, Triennale uh, 2077 and uh, Nepal Pavilion at the uh, 59th Venice uh, Biennale, just to name a few. So uh, Mansil, uh, welcome. And uh, just a quick question on, uh, I mean, thank you for the wonderful illustrations and uh, 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 would you like to ex, you know just give us a little glimpse uh, to your like process into how you approach the illustrations for these uh, three wonderful uh, stories that we have uh, that will be featuring this week? Um, yeah, um, good to be here. Good to be with all of you and the writers. Um, yeah, really grateful to have uh, I illustrated these wonderful essays. Um, so for the first story, Containing Lighting, um, it was about um, absence in a lot of sense. So when I went through the story, um, there were uh, so many scenarios where that, that was brought up and uh, I had portrayed um, an illustration along with the lightning, uh, which kind of shows the opposing element to it. Um, <laughs> I don't know uh, if that's what it meant, but yeah, um, the contrast um, was what I wanted to portray in the illustration. Um, so for the second story, um, by, um, sorry, I, I don't, is it si Kaya, Saya, sorry? Kiara. Kiara, okay. Um, yeah, the second story is about um, the opposites, you know, like you just said, uh, the past and the future and in the illustration, I wanted to also show the opposites as well as the constant being the reincarnations in the background, um, which was there during her time uh, as a student and as a nun. Um, so yeah, the opposites and the con constant, um, yeah, I wanted to portray that. For the um, third story, um, uh, I wanted to uh, show the journey and the destination both in the same scene. Um, I feel I really uh, felt the need to do it. Um, and well, the headlights, I use the headlights to um, show the ultimate destination, which is his family, you know, his wife and his son. So yeah, that's basically <laughs> all of the three, um, what I had thought and I illustrated it. So yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Mansil. Um, I hope you join us uh, next week as well. Uh, yeah, we'll have the other uh, three writers who'll be reading uh, because I think they would also love to hear from you and uh, as well as everyone else. Um, okay, so thanking our readers once more. 
uh, we could now move on to uh, the much awaited discussion on uh, South Asian literary and publishing landscape. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, and I would like to uh, welcome to the discussion our panelists for today, uh, Sonia Ferrero from London, uh, Rifat Monim from Dhaka, and uh, Afshan Shafi from Lahore. Um, before we dive in, uh, let me uh, introduce our panelists, uh, so starting with uh, Sonia Falero, who is the founder uh, of the literary incubator, uh, South Asia Speaks, and uh, co-founder of DECA, a digital first publishing house. Uh, she's also the uh, author of the narrative nonfiction, uh, The Good Girls and Ordering Killing, which was nominated for the Royal Society of Literature on Dutchie Prize and the ALCAS uh, Gold Dagger for Nonfiction, as well as being uh, a New York Times editor's choice and a Human Rights Watch uh, book club pick. Um, her earlier book was Beautiful Thing, Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bar, uh, which was nominated for Lethka Ulysses Award uh, for the Art of Reportage and named the Sunday Times Travel Book of the Year. Uh, she lives in London, where she's uh, a 2023 Royal uh, Literary Fellow and a 2023 Fourth London Foundation Fellow. Sonia, uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, uh, next, I, uh, next, we have Rifat Munim from Dhaka. Uh, Rifat is a bilingual writer, translator, editor, and journalist. Uh, he was the literary editor of Dhaka Tribune. Um, he was a jury member of the DS, uh, DSC Prize for South Asian Literature uh, in 2019. Uh, his books include uh, Bangladesh, 50 Short Stories in English Translation, editor, and Bangladesh in WikiLeaks, editor. Um, his essays and articles on different aspects of Bangladeshi society and literature and South Asian English uh, writing have appeared in uh, World Literature Today, English Pen, uh, Scroll, Outlook India, uh, Asia Democracy Chronicles, Asia News Network, Dhaka Tribune, and the Daily Star. Uh, welcome, Rifat, again. It's great to have you here. Uh, next Thank up, you. we Thank have uh, next up we have Afshan Shafi from Lahore. Uh, she is a poet and a poetry editor. Uh, her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Poetry, Poetry Veils, Black Box uh, Manifold, Flag Plus Wide, Luna Luna, Clinic, and 3AM Magazine. Her poems have also appeared in numerous anthologies. Uh, she has previously served as poetry editor for The Bissing Slate, uh, as an assistant editor for The Good Times magazine, and as a contributing books editor at Libas Now. She's currently a poetry editor at the uh, Aleph uh, Review and is working on her first novel. Welcome, Afshan. Thank you. So uh, just a note to our audience before we begin, um, you can comment or send in your questions through our chat, uh, and I and I uh, and I will, as as time permits, uh, take up those questions or integrate them to uh, to the discussion. Um, so to start things off, I would like to uh, turn to Rifat and Afshan. If you could give us a, a a quick summary, I know this is a difficult task, uh, but if you could give us a quick summary of the notable trends shaping the literary scene in Bangladesh and Pakistan today. Uh, you know, I'm sure we have as a, um, you know, as a region, we have a lot of, we share a lot of similarities, but I think this summary will help to get a general sense of the industry and some of the unique challenges faced by authors and publishers in your respective countries. And let Rifat start. I thought I'd say, uh, <laughs> Afsan will start. Okay, fine, I'll, I'll start. The problem. In fact, uh, the Bangladeshi, uh, you know, like every other South Asian country, Bangladesh also has um, um, an English writing scene and um, a vernacular uh, literary writing scene. So uh, by vernacular, I basically mean uh, the Bengali uh, writing scene because uh, there are some other indigenous uh, languages, but, and they're also now uh, doing much better than before, like the Chakma language and yeah, some, some other like Monipuri language. But um, anyway, so first uh, I think we don't have much time. I just very briefly reflect on the English writing scene. And uh, when we talk about some other questions that have been sent by Merlin, I think I'll touch upon the Bengali uh, writing scene as well, uh, because we at some point will have to address the translation issues of vernacular languages. So 
the English writing scene in Bangladesh uh, actually is not very long. I mean, not as long as um, the English writing scene in India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka is. In fact, I don't think um, uh, before Tahmima Anam's uh, The Golden Age was published and it owned the uh, Commonwealth uh, Writers' Prize, perhaps for the uh, first book uh, written by a novelist. Before that, uh, we didn't have actually much going on in the English writing scene. But the first remarkable incident was um, uh, the publication of a novel by Adip Khan. And that book also won a, a Commonwealth Literary Prize. And uh, that, in, that thing happened uh, in 1995. But that event, even though it was a good book, otherwise it wouldn't uh, win a Commonwealth Writers' Prize, it didn't really create an impact in the Bangladeshi literary scene because the English reading public was not really, you know, uh, big. So, oh, uh, so Adip Khan was uh, part of the uh, diaspora community. He was living in Australia and he's a Bangladeshi Australian writer. So uh, after Tahmima Anam's novel was published, it actually, it was the first novel that created some impact on the Bangladeshi writing scene. There was a lot of discussion in Bangladesh about this book and it was uh, reviewed in Times Literary Supplement. It was reviewed in many other places, it won an hour. So after that, uh, actually uh, a lot of writers, you know, uh, came on board and, and started writing. So uh, I think the next uh, writer who actually inspired or gave, gave a push to the uh, Bangladeshi English writing scene was Mahmoud Rahman. Uh, he's a Bangladeshi American writer. Uh, and uh, his uh, short story collection, Killing the Water, it's a very nice book. It was published by Penguin India. Uh, uh, it had stories about partition, about the 1971 Liberation War, and about also uh, you know, issues that uh, immigrants in the US uh, face. It, it, it was a nice book and well-received in South Asia. And uh, after that, um, I think there was uh, Kaji Ani Samet, uh, who was also, who is also, an organizer and a literary activist. He's one of the actually directors of, he's one of the directors of uh, Dhaka Lit Fest. Uh, at some point I'll talk about Dhaka Lit Fest and how Dhaka Lit Fest has done a lot to, you know, uh, give or provide platforms to Bangladeshi writers and uh, anyway, uh, later on about that. So uh, the, uh, Kazi Anissa Ahmed has published a short story collection and uh, a novel and also a novella. And, and those are all well received and published simultaneously in Bangladesh and in the US. So you see most of the writers, so uh, I'm supposed to uh, reflect on the trends. So most of the writers are part of the immigrants or diaspora community living in the UK, in the US and in the, or in Canada or, or Australia. And uh, then uh, there was this uh, book by Zia Hader Rahman, which did very well. It was also reviewed in, uh, reviewed by uh, James Wood in, uh, I believe in Times Literary Supplement and some other uh, famous uh, platforms or, or magazines. Zia Hader Rahman's book's name was In Light of, In the Light of What We Know. Uh, so uh, it also, I think it also created a impact, an impact in Bangladesh and also, uh, um, you know, beyond Bangladesh, across South Asia. Then um, there was, uh, in 2017 or 18, uh, Arif Anwar, another writer, another uh, Bangladeshi-born uh, Canadian writer, uh, his novel, The Storm, uh, was published and it, all, it was also very uh, well received, both in the US and in South Asia. So then there was uh, Nadim Jaman, uh, then there was um, uh, Numai Choudhury, then there was Shazia Omar, then there was Saad Zaid Hosen. So the trend that I, I, I see actually uh, characterizing Bangladeshi English writing scene is, you know, uh, the contributions were, uh, which is not very unlike uh, the Pakistani and the Sri Lankan scene and to some extent the Indian scene. The biggest uh, contributions were made by uh, the immigrants, the Bangladeshi born immigrants living in the US, living in the UK, living in the Australia or Canada, like Arif Anwar uh, lives in Canada. Uh, Tamima Anam uh, lives, lives in um, uh, UK. Uh, uh, Kaji Anis Ahmed divides his time between Bangladesh and you know, uh, UK or US sometimes. 
So uh, that is one thing. And, and these, uh, these uh, immigrant writers or, or writers uh, from the Bangladeshi diaspora communities, uh, I think, uh, yeah, they, uh, they're, uh, when, when we actually consider them collectively, uh, they give us um, a lot of diversity to think about, to uh, actually, uh, and although some of the uh, writers like Tahmima Anam and Arif Anwar, then Nadim Zaman, they were like their uh, other South Asian uh, uh, colleagues from other countries. Uh, they were very much uh, politically and socially aware, very much uh, politically conscious, and they were using history as a material of fiction. Uh, so that's that. But uh, uh, as far as uh, I am concerned as a writer and a literary editor, I felt that uh, the homegrown writers uh, needed to do more. So uh, mm, that's when I think, um, at this point, I think I should uh, mention Tahmima Anam and Kazi Anis Ahmed again, because uh, Tahmima Anam and uh, another, there's another writer, Sadaf Saz, they started this uh, literary festival called uh, Hey Festival. And uh, this festival actually created a very big platform for Bangladeshi writers to, it actually uh, uh, brought together, you know, many writers from across the world. And it actually introduced Bangladeshi writers to, to literary agents and publishers. So uh, that's how, and, and later on, Hey Festival, Dhaka uh, became Dhaka Lit Fest. That's another story, but uh, this literary festival actually provided, uh, actually gave a, very uh, important boost to the Bangladeshi writing scene. So that's when homegrown writers started getting a platform and they started writing. So that's how we got Saad Hussein, who now is a very uh, famous uh, sci-fi writer and he's now working with Tor. And uh, that's how we got uh, Numai Choudhury. Uh, his book was very well received in, his book's name is Babu Bangladesh, very well received in South Asia. And that's how we also got um, many other writers. But, uh, in short, when it comes to homegrown writers, I personally had, um, I, I was not uh, happy about something because uh, initially the homegrown writers uh, were all of them were, you know, coming from um, very rich family background. So I felt there was a lack of diversity, you know, like in India or Pakistan, um, uh, writers, those who write in English, they were coming from, you know, all sorts of different uh, social backgrounds, you know, rich, middle class, higher class, even, even lower middle class. So, uh, but after uh, the Dhaka Lit Fest happened and all writers from all, you know, social backgrounds were exposed to, to uh, all these big writers, Booker winning writers, Nobel laureates, and all other writers who are very famous English writers. So I think that that gave a, much needed boost to the Bangladeshi writing scene. And now we are seeing the emergence of a new breed of writers who are actually writing uh, very interesting stories uh, about, uh, you know, uh, about people of Bangladesh, about uh, not just about uh, the rich people, but about, you know, all sorts of people that was really needed in Bangladesh. And now this new breed of writer, I'm really hopeful and optimistic that they will bring about many more interesting changes. And now I think Bangladeshi literature has got to a place where we are, we can say that we are really contributing very meaningfully to the South Asian fiction community. Uh, there is a, very recently there, were, there was this novel by, it's called Shujo's Clan. It's written by Ifat Nawaz. It's a wonderful book. And I believe it will create uh, uh, a huge impact in South Asia and also in Bangladesh. Before that, Nadim Zaman's novel, The Inheritors, uh, came out. Uh, he's in um, uh, Bangladesh American novelist, where, uh, whereas Ifat Nawaz is based in Bangladesh, although he, she has been living uh, in India for uh, several years now. So, uh, and also the, ma the the very, very young breed of writers, uh, which includes Shah Tazriya Nasrafi, who I believe will be featured in, in, in the second um, um, uh, day of this, uh, of this Himal Fiction Fest. And uh, there are, uh, and, and he's not alone, you know, there, there are, a big number of very young uh, writers who are exploring many themes and many storytelling techniques in their stories. That makes me very hopeful. So I don't think I should carry on any longer because I should let Afshan and uh, Sonia speak uh, you know, on these issues. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rifat. I mean, that was a very succinct summary. And uh, I mean, the transition between 
you know how most of the time it was migrant writers who were who were engaging in English literature in your country, and then it kind of uh, you know the transition to uh, you know Bangladeshi based writers uh, who are kind of taking up the mantle now. I think it's quite uh, like I said uh, very similar in uh, in other parts of the region as well. Um, Afshan, would you like to give us a, a very short snapshot of uh, of Pakistani English literature or literature in general? I guess. Um, well, um, I think Pakistani literature um, is uh, at a very interesting time right now uh, because uh, when I was growing up, uh, we had um, you know novelists like Mohsen Hamid, Kamda Shamsi, uh, Uzma Aslam Khan, and um, Nadeem Aslam, who is a British uh, Pakistani writer. Um, but now I've um, kind of noticed a trend of people submitting a lot of short stories and poetry to journals, and they might not even kind of hanker after uh, like a um, full length uh, manuscript or a novel. Um, so um, especially uh, like working for the Alif Review for around uh, seven years, uh, I've realized there's so many stories that uh, people, you know, just wanted to write about. It's really been, uh, I think we've provided a platform which has been kind of like a cathar cathartic as well. And, um, uh, when we first started, we didn't actually realize how many people are actually writing in English in Pakistan. And uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of genuine, uh, unique voices as well. Uh, they're not all kind of like imitators, but they kind of they have their own stamp and their own voice. Uh, so, um, and also, uh, I think people are more brave now. Um, the younger generation is already writing about uh, very personal topics, uh, kind, you know, uh, about their lives, about uh, it could be addiction, it could be their sexuality, it could be, you know, body image. A lot of personal themes are um, really coming up. And um, so um, that's how the Alif Review has uh, basically uh, kept on uh, going for around seven years, because we didn't really even see that a literary journal coming out once again in Pakistan would actually, you know, do so well. But another thing I've realized is that uh, literary festivals in Pakistan are doing very well because people here, like, they need, they feel the need for a community and uh, for dialogue. And I feel like it gives us a chance to kind of uh, go back in history as well and kind of, uh, there's like a, they, there's kind of like an archival, uh, you kind of a resurrection of you know historical narratives and kind of uh, there's an archive now coming up of uh, Pakistani literature. So you know we can there's enough work you know now happening in the sense that we can say it's like the body of Pakistani literature. So it's not sparse anymore, um, and the future kind of looks quite bright. Yeah, the short summary. <laughs> that's that's very. Uh... Hopeful to hear, and um, I mean, maybe we could uh, um, kind of continue the discussion with Sonia. Uh, just like you know, Rifat mentioned, you know, there's been a increasing interest in diverse voices and underrepresented narratives, especially in the the um, I guess the international uh, publishing scene. Um, so, as a writer who has had a you know long successful career, you know, moving from South Asia to the US and then to the UK. How can South Asian authors who are based in South Asia, uh, the people that uh, Rifat was uh, referring to, how can they seize this opportunity, this moment to kind of elevate uh, South Asian stories and to contribute to a more inclusive literary landscape? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, so just very quickly, hi again, and it's so great to be on this panel with Afshan and Rifat. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, about South Asia Speaks, which is a mentorship that I help run for South Asian writers. Um, I've just been writing for so long, Marlon, and I've, you know, I really, I've, the lesson that I've learned is resilience. You know, mm. and that's something that I tell all our fellows as well. Just write your book. Um, one of the things that early career writers tend to get caught up with, and I do completely understand this because that's the situation that I found myself in, is, you know, what will happen once the book is published? You know, will you find the right agent? Will it get published um, outside of the home country? And I think these are these are important questions because 
ultimately writing is a business and it is your business to manage your career. Um, but the first, the first port of call is always having a complete manuscript, you know. And at that point, one of the things that early career writers tend to tussle with is, uh, you know, what we always struggle with, which is authenticity. You know, can we be authentic to ourselves, to our stories, um, to our primary audience, while also being accessible to a wider audience? Which I think is a perfectly good um, question to ask. And, and, and there's no shame at all in wanting to reach the widest possible audience. As creative people, naturally, we should, we should desire that, uh, you know, as, as many right readers as possible come to our work. But on, on that question, it's, it's also a matter of um, simply doing what feels right for you. Everybody has a different approach to this. Uh, with Beautiful Thing and The Good Girls, both my books of nonfiction, for example, they are very deeply rooted in the society in which they are based. And that worked for me. And I think that if it works for you as a writer, then it ultimately does translate to a wider audience because it shows, I think, perhaps in, in the quality of work. Um, but I do think that firstly, you know, it is about completing the manuscript. It is about doing it in a way that feels real to you. And I think it's also about taking comfort in the fact that good work does always find a home. You know, it just does. I don't know what the alchemy is. Um, and I think perhaps for some people, it means applying for fellowships and writing workshops or a mentorship program like South Asia Speaks or, you know, submitting short stories. Um, it may be about finding the right editor or a reading group. There is no one solution, but ultimately the goal is do the work. You know, the work does speak for itself. Resilience and doing good work. Um, very good advice to anyone, I guess. Um, and I mean, you spoke about, you know, good work, finding a good home. So I would like to go to uh, Afshan. Now in your capacity as, the, uh, as this widely published poet and also uh, the poetry editor of the Aleph Review, how would you say, like, what are some of the uh, preferences, you know, within the poetry genre? in South Asia that you see? Uh, because it's something that uh, I hear a lot for decades in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, that, that poetry is not marketable. Uh, you know, it doesn't sell. So, uh, you know, this is purely from a Sri Lankan perspective. Um, so how would you, how do you think poets can, uh, uh, you know, engage uh, readers and to keep poetry thriving? And this, this idea that uh, Sonia brought out about, you know, good work, finding a good home. Yes. Um, well, um, I think a lot of people are writing poetry in South Asia because the kind of the, I think the poetry submissions for the Aldif Review outnumber the, fic, uh, the submissions for fiction. Uh, so that was quite, I mean, I was quite happy about as the poetry editor, but I think everybody was surprised, um, you know, okay. This, this such good quality uh, poetry coming out. But I think um, what, what uh, was hard thing about it is that there was a lot of wordplay and a lot of skill with language that we noticed um, in some of the younger uh, uh, you know, poets uh, who were submitting to us. And um, there's also kind of like uh, a divergence from tropes, um, from kind of like the subcontinental tropes. Uh, so um, this, you know, like they always say, there's not that much about monsoons and whatever <laughs> coming up. Though, I mean, uh, even if someone is using cliche, they're using it in a fresh way. So, I mean, uh, these poets are very well read. Um, they're very well kind of exposed to uh, kind of the smaller literary magazines, uh, you know, which publish good poetry. Uh, they, uh, they, they might not have mentorship, but they're taking the time out to work kind of on their work and create like uh, their own kind of personal brand. We see, I, I mean, I see a lot of uh, poets on Instagram who are doing very well, uh, female poets. Uh, I think that uh, they found their audience uh, kind of uh, locally. Uh, so, I mean, there's, um, I would say that 
I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm about poetry right now, maybe because it's shorter or uh, I think it's doing well on Instagram, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, it could be the Rupi Kaur effect, um, which is kind of now, uh, it's kind of blossomed into a more literary, <laughs> you know, a popularization of the more literary type of poetry as well. So um, I think everything is doing well right now. Spoken word is also doing well. Uh, uh, poetry, language poetry is also doing quite well. So um, yeah, I think a lot of younger writers were just looking for platforms. So when you're providing them a platform to submit to, um, I think, uh, yeah, the future, yeah, seems quite bright for poetry, honestly. That's again, very encouraging to hear. Um, I hope these platforms can kind of, you know, translate into, you know, like publishing opportunities um, yes. as, as well. Um, that so, is, actually, uh, yeah, that, that is a challenge. On, you don't have poetry presses. So yeah, that we can talk about probably. Mm. Um, so Afshan spoke about like um, wordplay and skill with language in emerging Pakistani poets. Rifat, I'd like to come back to you as a bilingual writer. Uh, now, you know, South Asian literature encompasses a wide range of languages, dialects, and cultural traditions. Now, uh, and we often see uh, as bilinguals, you know, we see how, uh, you know, uh, writers of bilingual, you know, like basically writing in two or three different languages are able to uh, effortlessly sometimes, you know, uh, you know, move between languages. And this is, this would be a unique uh, bilingual experience. And it's uh, probably a unique, bi because it's, uh, it's, it's something that I found uh, would be quite difficult to translate, you know, some of these wordplay, some of the, 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 I guess, uh, jokes, right? Uh, so how can like translation efforts be enhanced? to, to uh, you know, bridge language barriers and to uh, facilitate, again, thinking uh, public, you know, the, as a publishing industry, as a business, publication as a business, how can, you know, we bridge these language barriers uh, to facilitate the global dissemination of diverse South Asian stories? So that's a, that's a very nice question. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, I also work as a uh, translator and also uh, part of the activism that I have always done was to promote translation, not just uh, to promote uh, translation of Bengali literature, but also help promote translation of other vernacular literatures from South Asia. So, uh, well, I think there's no other way uh, translation is the only way to uh, to do this, to you know, to uh, to ensure the global dissemination of more and more South Asian stories, and also, uh, which I think is more important, also to uh, reach Bengali stories to say an Urdu reader or a Hindi reader or an Anglophone reader, and and the same thing, you know, uh, I mean, to ensure that. An Urdu story, or a Hindi story, or a Kannada story, or a Nepali story written in Nepal is actually, uh, you know, makes its way to Bangladesh or to West Bengal to the to the Bengali speaking readers. Or so, uh, I think uh, we haven't uh, tapped into this. I mean, as much as we should have, and it's only recently that we are seeing uh, very, you know, concentrated and much organized effort uh, to. Uh, give translation a big boost uh, because we don't have in any uh, South Asian country, we don't have a lot of uh, bilingual writers. In Bangladesh, um, we have just have a couple of bilingual writers, Shagupta Sharmin Tania and Sred Mozul Islam, I think. So uh, I think that's the only way, but I also think that uh, translation of vernacular uh, South Asian languages into English has now a very good uh, future because um, translators are very aware and they have built a very productive and nice working relationship with agents and publishers. So, you know, they're from uh, when it comes to translation from Bengali to English, there are uh, Urna Vasinha, uh, who is not only a translator, but who also uh, actually 
helps, you know, uh, uh, other translators find the platform. And I know that uh, who's working with Sonia uh, with her amazing South Asia Speaks. So I think we need more organizations or more initiatives like South Asia Speaks. And very recently, there has been this initiative called SALT Project. It is, um, it is uh, basically called South Asian Literature in Translation Project. It's uh, initiated, it's actually basically um, supervised by Chicago University and uh, it's uh, being looked after by Daniel Han and, and Jason Grunebaum. And it is actually trying to put, create a platform for South Asian literature in English translation. The main uh, push came from the fact that the amount of translation that gets published in the US every year, only 1% of it is constituted by South Asian fiction in English translation. So that's how terrible the picture is. So I, I, uh, we all feel very uh, grateful to Chicago University and Daniel Han and Jason Grunbaum that they came up with this idea. And um, as part of this project, translators from all South Asian countries, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from India, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka are coming together so that we can all, uh, you know, uh, contribute to how we can promote more and more South Asian fiction to the US and to the English reading public, you know, to the English reading uh, audiences in US, UK, Australia, Canada, and, and blah, blah, blah. So I think we need more initiatives like this, but uh, what is, uh, what, is uh, what, what gives me hope and what should give us all hope that now uh, there is, now translation is not, a very neglected genre anymore in South Asia. I think translated remained a neglected genre for a long time, but now it's no, that's that's not the picture. Uh, it's doing very well that uh, because there are a lot of literary festivals going on. I know that there no literary festival is flawless <laughs> because you know they need funding and 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 everything. But still, literary festivals are doing a good job. It's creating and uh, they're creating platforms for you know, translators, for original writers, for publishers to interact, to come together. And there are also some very good awards like JCB awards, um, and uh, which is definitely based in, in uh, which is an Indian award. Previously, there was the DSC prize for South Asian fiction, which was a wonderful initiative, which uh, is non-existent now, uh, I, I believe for a lack of funding. So uh, I think this kind of initiative needs to be uh, th there needs to be more and more this kind of initiative so that uh, translators get more funding. One of the challenges that translators uh, face is, is funding. You know, uh, there are books for which translators need to spend like two years at a stretch, sometimes more than two years. So how can they survive by, you know, working a full-time job and then doing the translation on the side? So all these uh, challenges uh, are there but still translation is uh, uh, doing very well. Uh, and especially I should mention Westland, they have this uh, translation wing called ECA. And uh, I believe you are going to uh, hear from uh, Kartika in your next uh, iteration. So uh, they're, also, they're, they're doing a very good job there. And um, other uh, multinational and independent publishers, uh, South Asian, they're also now um, actually coming on board. So, so yeah, we need, we need to, uh, you know, uh, pay more attention to translation, not just to translation of vernacular literatures into English, but also we need to pay more attention, which is not happening, which should happen more. Translation of Bengali literature into Urdu, into Hindi, into Kannada, and the same thing, you know, the other way around. Translation of Hindi literature not only into English, but also into Bengali, into Nepalese. And uh, this should also happen more. Thank you. Thanks, Rifat. So, um, I mean, you just mentioned the fact that we need more initiatives, more collaborations, uh, you know, like South Asia Speaks. Uh, this will, uh, you know, contribute to the growth and promotion of the region's literature. Um, so, I mean, we have uh, Sonia here. So question is for you. Uh, if you could please share with us your experiences, you know, as the founder of South Asia Speaks, how has this uh, you know, uh, this platform being, uh, what, what, uh, what do you see as the, um, uh, as some of the things that you have achieved and 
how do you uh, plan on moving this forward and also bringing in more and more collaborations and collaborative initiatives like this? Okay, yeah. So uh, let me start by saying that South Asia Speaks came together because, um, you know, me personally and, and many writers that I knew hadn't received mentorship in the early stages of their career, any sort of mentorship, you know, so we didn't have anybody who could tell us how to, you know, how to write a first draft or, or who to go to to get published. There was no concept of creative writing classes or workshops or gatherings. Um, when I was writing my first book of nonfiction, Beautiful Thing and Living in Bombay, um, I didn't want other emerging writers in India and elsewhere in South Asia to go through that experience because I think it's completely unnecessary. If you have talent and you're willing to do the work, I really think your writing life should be made easy for you. So the purpose of South Asia Speaks was to offer that support to writers without asking for anything in return other than the, 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 the you know, respect for what we are doing by working on the project that the fellow has proposed. So we don't charge any fees, uh, of course. There are uh, There is no age restriction. And the requirement is that the, the, the fellow should be working on a major project, right? So it is a book of fiction, nonfiction, translation, which is headed by Arunava Sinha, as, as Rifat pointed out. We recently started a poetry fellowship under Tishani Doshi. Um, we also, um, looking at climate projects under Fatima Bhutto. So we have a wide range and we take people on based only on the quality of their proposed project. So we don't even ask that you send in a CV. We are not interested in your reference letters. All we care about is the work. Um, so now we are in year three and it is now possible for me to, to say to you that I am seeing certain trends. Okay, so to begin with, Marlon, I have to say we get upwards of 500 applications um, and they are really good quality, you know? So when we launched in year one, I think a lot of people were just applying and just, because I mean, they couldn't have known what we were in a position to offer or what we wanted, right? But now we get hundreds of high quality applications. And the painful part for me as, you know, the project director is, to say no to a lot of them. And I just want to actually use this forum to say that most of the time, the reason we say no is because we can't find a fit between the project and a mentor, right? Because that has to be a good fit. The mentor is going to be working for an entire year on that project. So it's a project that has to speak to them. So we can't find that fit. But what we are seeing is, you know, incredibly high quality writing, incredibly ambitious. And whereas earlier I was finding um, South Asian writing represented primarily by fiction, now I'm seeing an enormous amount of interest in presenting nonfiction projects. So nonfiction is really huge. Translation, as Rafat pointed out, is huge. Um, we are getting poetry, of course, now because we started uh, the mentorship, but another area that's very interesting to our fellows is partition. And uh, we do have a dedicated mentorship for partition projects that is um, headed by Anchal Malotra, who's, you know, an oral historian and now also a, a, a novelist. But it seems to me reading all the material that comes in, that what is happening is that writers are responding to these enormous political changes that are taking place across South Asia. And you did often see that in fiction projects, you know, um, but now it seems like everything I'm reading is a response to the turmoil. And some writers are doing it head on and some are looking at it in a very sideways, sort of fashion, you know, they might be talking through stories of love, um, but actually it's really about oppression. So I'm seeing a very, um, I'm seeing a great deal of involvement in what's happening in the world around and a desire to respond rather than to be quiet. And I really admire that uh, in our writers, you know? So th that's what we are seeing. Um, Moving forward, South Asia Speaks is going to do a couple of things. Um, 
we have uh, a dedicated mentorship that we are hoping to begin for writers with disabilities. It's something that we're still working on. So hopefully we can make that happen with our new class. Um, and the other thing that we're starting, which is in response to, you know, sort of a, a unhappiness from South Asian writers living outside South Asia, because one of our one of our rules is you have to be living in South Asia. And the reason we have that rule is because, you know, the opportunities are so limited for writers in South Asia. Whereas the truth is, you know, as somebody who lives in London as a South Asian and has lived in the States, there simply are more opportunities. I mean, the competition is fierce, but there are more opportunities. So we need to support those who need it the most. So that's why SAS is only for writers living in South Asia. But next year, we are going to be launching South Asia Speaks Diaspora, which is going to be open, a very limited number of mentorships, um, which are going to be open to South Asians living in the diaspora, uh, you know, with a preference for those living in the global South. So in that way, what we're trying to do is increase the number of opportunities we're able to give writers, build this community, because our writers, in addition to working on their projects, they really tend to support each other in sharing opportunities and sharing skills, um, in even writing together. So we want to build that community and we want to continue thinking about ways in which we can give South Asian writers the same opportunities, the same privileges that are fairly easily accessible to writers in the same stage of their career living in the West, you know? Um, because we have this, I mean, this is such a cliche, but this is so true. There is extraordinary talent, you know, and the, the perseverance is there. And you put those two together and, you know, we need to support them. So we're going to continue thinking of ways to just support our writers. And in whatever way, whatever way we can, um, just give them a good start. You know, that's really, that, that's, our, that's our goal, really. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I mean, just to uh, change directions a little, I think we have a question from, uh, from the chat um, about um, independent bookstores. Um, I would maybe go to Afshan first. Um, would, you, uh, would you be able to shed some light on the role of independent bookstores, um, especially within uh, Pakistan? Um, and like, uh, you know, how do those platforms, uh, you know, how do they create visibility for local authors? And uh, I think the question was directed at Rifat, but we'll get to Rifat as well. Yeah, well, um, in the last uh, five years, uh, I think the independent bookstore scene has kind of uh, picked up because uh, they've started hosting a lot of open mics and, uh, They've started kind of uh, like doing mini concerts and uh, just trying to get more of an audience uh, into the independent bookstores. Uh, I would say that it's more of a niche uh, kind of uh, customer base that they have as yet. Uh, I would say that the major chains have uh, more of a footfall, um, but um, I would like to see more independent bookstores actually come up uh, with well curated like a well-curated bookstore with its own kind of stamp, its own kind of personal brand. Uh, but there's one very good uh, store called The Last Word Books. And, uh, you know, they, they, they get sold out as soon as a new shipment comes. So, I mean, somebody is buying a lot um, of books. Um, but yes, I agree with Rifat as well. I think there needs to be uh, kind of uh, more of, I would say, democratic appeal to the reading culture um, here, I think uh, uh, lots of people from different backgrounds are reading and writing, but I would say that perhaps their buying power might not be enough for, you know, these independent bookstores and kind of like the niche reading circle scene. So, they, I mean, there must, there should be more ways in which uh, books are available more readily to a broader base of people. So, I mean, um, yes, I would say there is still quite a lot of, uh, yeah, room for growth there. Yeah. Honest answer. <laughs> yeah. Rifat, would you like to add to that? I think there were there, some uh, member of the audience was asking for a recommendation. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, why not? Because, uh, you know, um, in Bangladesh, uh, in the past 10 years, the actually the literary scene has, as I actually uh, responded earlier, has grown exponentially. And uh, this growth uh, has been tied up to a growth in bookstores as well, you know. Um, independent bookstores have grown and uh, there are like six to seven or more dedicated very book independent big bookstores uh, that sell only books and uh, a lot of those books are English books and uh, there are actually many other platforms that online offline that sell books and uh, they can also be called independent bookstores and I think they have contributed a lot but just like um, Apsan just pointed out, I think there is room for growth, a lot of uh, room for growth, because, you know, these uh, bookstores, like um, multinational publishers, uh, they consider what sells and what doesn't sell. And, um, you know, that's a problem. That's a problem because uh, there needs to be bookstores, like Apsan pointed out, with some personal brand, bookstores which will sell books on partition, whether they uh, bring in profits or not. Bookstores which uh, uh, you know, offer books on translation, translation of Kannada literature, translation of Urdu literature, translation of Nepalese literature, but that's not happening. And also there, uh, I think uh, a, a, a large part of the problem is with the reading audience as well, because you know, Bangladeshi reading audience, a lot of them are interested in reading uh, the Booker winning author or the Pulitzer winning author or the even though the Pulitzer winning author is writing about America. So what? They, uh, I don't know why so much interest in a Pulitzer winning author because obviously he's or she is writing about America. Man, are, you are living in Dhaka. So you should be wanting to read a book about Dhaka or Delhi or Pakistan or say South Asia. So I think part of the problem lies with the audience as well, but um, still, <laughs> They have, they have contributed a lot because now there was a time 10 to 20 years ago when uh, Bangladeshi reading public wouldn't be able to, you know, even though they could afford it, they wouldn't be able to access or get their hands on um, novels by Indian authors, novels by Pakistani authors or Sri Lankan authors. But now, you know, all these books are available in Bangladesh. Obviously, uh, those that sell more uh, are, uh, you know, available in bigger numbers, but still, so that's it. Um, so I think we're kind of running out of time, but uh, let's have just one last question. Uh, since Rifat just uh, spoke about how readership is more prone towards, you know, reading the Booker or the Pulitzer winner. I mean, last year's Booker Prize winner is a South Asian. So uh, just to um, speak about these international awards, how important, this is a general question for all, how important do you think is it for South Asian authors to uh, find representation in the international literary awards and you know those prize circuits. Um, and what role do you think these accolades play, since the Kanan Booker is also a South Asian? Who should answer this? Well, you can start. I mean, this is for all three. This can be our final question. I think, I think Sonia should start, yeah. Sonia should yeah, start. yeah, I'm happy to. I, I think it's obviously incredible when somebody, um, you know, who belongs to our South Asian community um, gets recognition and makes us, us all feel proud and that's, that's perfectly natural. And I think we've been very lucky in that the books that have received extraordinary acclaim, uh, including Shahan's book, or you look at, you know, Kiran Desai or Nati Roy, um, and, and of course, many others, they've been extraordinary. You know, they really have been just divine, and it's wonderful that they are gaining a huge leadership, um, readership, not a leadership. Um, but, you know, as somebody who runs a mentorship program and who works with emerging writers, um, I have to be the one to say that there's a lot that goes into determining who wins an award. You know, it's never just the one thing saying that the best book won the award is like saying, you know, the most beautiful woman in the world won Miss Universe or Miss World. I mean, that is obviously not the case. You know, I mean, it is a lot goes into 
make winning an award, uh, but a lot also goes into building a career. And I think that as an emerging writer, you are going to be, you will be uh, much better off, much better served um, in thinking of how to build your career rather than thinking of how to win an award and somehow right. convincing yourself, which I understand it, it happens, but don't convince yourself that if I don't win the booker or all I need to do is win the booker, you know, like the booker or the Pulitzer, these cannot be the end goals for writers. A writer's goal is, is to write, is to respond to the world, is to engage with the world. It's to build a career, to, to fill a bookshelf, hopefully with work uh, of, of which they can be very proud and of which they can say, you know, is has the potential to, to stand the test of time. So that is the ambition. And sometimes uh, working towards that goal may, may result in a prize, which would be amazing. And sometimes it won't, but that shouldn't come as a disappointment because a prize is something over which the writer has the least control. You know, whereas the thing that you have the most control over is the quality of your writing. So focus on what you can control, not on which something over which you really have no say ultimately. Thank you so much, Sonia. Any uh, Afshan and Rifat, would you like to add anything to? No, I completely agree with Sonia. I think it's a very organic process. I think, of course, that there's a lot of solitude involved in being a writer, uh, but um, mentorship programs like South Asia speaks are kind of bringing you know a whole community and kind of a writer also needs emotional support actually we've been um writers in pakistan and india or perhaps bangladesh we've, it's it's been quite lonely for a lot of them and um so um yes i would say that um the booker and the pulitzer uh i think i'm not sure if a lot of our writers are really even thinking about that at this stage but yes uh, maybe later on in this, in your uh, future discussion, you can speak about how people can find literary agents and kind of uh, how the publishing industry uh, in Pakistan and whatever can become more professional. So that um, people actually know that there's a publishing house to, which will publish their uh, novels and which will pay them for the writing. You see, that's very important as well. So we, th these are the challenges that, yes, a younger Pakistani writers do have to face. So we do need that kind of foreign support right now. And it is uh, always a good idea to kind of have a larger work in mind so you can get foreign access and, you know, all the marketing help you get from an international publisher. So, yeah, that I would say is important. Um, Rifat, any, anything to add? We might have lost Rifat. I mean, um, yeah, so another common South Asian experience these days is power cuts. Yeah. Uh, so um, Rifat was just saying that, uh, you know, that there, there could be a power cut in the middle of this. And, you know, it's a, I, I told him it's the same for us as well. Yeah, so same. I think we might, yeah, <laughs> I think we might have uh, lost him at the end. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think we've now come to the end of the panel and we've been privy to this riveting discussion uh, along with the wonderful readings that we heard at the beginning. And I would like to thank our writers and our illustrator and also thank you uh, to Afshan, Sonia and Rifat, our expert panel. Uh, please do support Himal Fiction Fest uh, by heading over to our website and reading the stories. Uh, we will also have a similar panel next week. Uh, I hope you'll join us then. Um, over to you, Roman. Marlon, I really don't have much to add except to say that you are a star. Thank you, first and foremost, to Marlon. Um, and thank you to all of you for taking time up off your, your Monday evenings. Um, and Sonia, Monday afternoon, I believe, where you are. Of course, uh, um, among our, our audience, uh, people from all over the world. Thank you for your time. Um, and. Yes, an absolutely wonderful discussion, um, riveting, just as Marlon said. It, there's so much insight and so much to share. It just once again reinforces me the frustration of not being able to do this in person um, on a regular basis because of um, some of the realities of our region, but that's what Zoom is for. 
Um, thank you to all of you and the biggest um, thanks, um, I think, from all of us. Um, you know, here we are talking about the current state um, of South Asian fiction, um, how to build a career, all of these things. But I think that the most important thing is for the next generation of South Asian voices to have these opportunities. Yeah. Um, Sonia, what you're talking about, I mean, running a, a a literary magazine, a poetry magazine in Pakistan. I mean, these are all labors of love. And I think uh, more than anything else, love to our three writers, Kiara, Sahir, Siddharth. Thank you for writing. To all of you, thank you for reading. Please do join us for the rest of the Fiction Fest over the next two weeks and come to himalmag.com to read. And that's it. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>